Thank you. Right. Can everyone both see and hear me? Uh, I think I speak for all of us when I say, it's so nice to be back. <laughs> um, it was a little trickier than usual uh, to get here, but um, I'm very glad and happy to have arrived. Um, before we begin uh, to get into my talk, I'd just like to lead a round of applause for the organizers for dealing with so many unexpected events in the lead up to the conference. You guys are fantastic. We appreciate you very much. Um, so some notes before we begin. So my slides are mostly images, uh, which I appreciate you may have trouble seeing. Um, so if you want to look afterwards about the slides, look into anything, um, they'll all be available online at my website, which is raspberrycheesecake.github.io. Um, and a content note, I'm going to talk about bombs, real life ones, and medical accidents. I'm not offended if anyone isn't interested. If it's not your cup of tea, feel free to sneak out and get yourself a real cup of tea, come back later. Um, for those of you who are interested to continue, this is going to be a bit of a long ride. So do bear with me. We will get on to software, uh, but it's a bit of a journey. So uh, bear that in mind. OK, so I'd like to introduce you all to the SS Richard Montgomery. For those of you who don't know, um, this is a sunken ship. She uh, sank in uh, 1944. She ran aground, uh, dragged her anchor in a force-eight gale, um, and uh, sank in a really interesting position. So the wreck's still there. She's actually about halfway between the mouth of the River Medway and the mouth of the River Thames. If we just zoom in a bit, you can see a bit more clearly. So we'll start to see there's an exclusion zone. It's about in the middle of the picture here. I'll zoom one more time, and you'll see. So she's above the Isle of Sheppey, sort of between the Isle of Sheppey and the Isle of Grain. And there's a diamond-shaped exclusion zone marked with uh, some yellow warning buoys. And that's where the SS Richard Montgomery lies. So the interesting thing about this ship is that she was full of bombs, uh, munitions for World War II. In her heyday, she looked like this. The Richard Montgomery was a Liberty ship. Um, Liberty ships were known for their uh, speed of construction. Uh, she wasn't uh, one of the record setters, but she was constructed within a matter of a couple of months. Her hull was laid down uh, in March 1943, and then she was actually launched on the 15th of June that same year. So very quickly put together for the war effort. Um, and she ran several successful supply missions going across the Atlantic, uh, supplying the Allies, uh, before she ultimately uh, met her fate. So on the 20th of August, 1944, it was a really stormy night, and she was anchored in a pretty shallow anchorage. She dragged her anchor. Um, ran aground, and the captain and crew quickly abandoned her because they could hear some ominous creaking from the hull, and they knew that the stuff she had aboard uh, was liable to go off. They had a sort of quick post-mortem inquiry. Um, this is a picture of her partially sunk. Um, they actually held that aboard the ship once it became clear that she wasn't going to go off immediately, which I'm sure must have focused their minds. Um, cleared the captain of... Uh, any uh, culpability for the accident, but um, realized that um, the priority was to salvage the cargo as much as possible um, in the coming days. So that's what they did. On the 23rd of August, they began trying to remove as many bombs as possible from the wreck. Um, and they did pretty well. They managed to recover, um, we think, about 50% uh, of her cargo before salvage ultimately had to be abandoned on the 25th of September, 1944. So here are some stevedores who are trying to recover the cargo. 
Um, ultimately, part of the reason the recovery was abandoned, aside from the ship um, breaking her back in increasingly bad weather, was because um, the salvagers had wanted more money, danger money, from the Admiralty, and they were a bit too cheap to pay for it. So they left her there, um, and she's actually still there. Obviously, at the time, there were a lot of more important things to focus people's minds. You know, it was the end of World War II, fairly shortly after that, and a lot of things had been damaged that needed fixing. So, in some ways, it's understandable. Um, but given that she's still filled with about half of her complement of explosives, you might reasonably ask why we haven't gotten around to doing anything about that still. In 2001, officials said, uh, quote, the time for procrastination is over. <laughs> that was over 20 years ago. It doesn't help that she was an official secret until around the 1960s, which is a little silly, given that if you go to the Isle of Sheppey, you can literally see her. She's not that far off the coast, about two and a half kilometers away from the town of Sheerness, lovely seaside town. Um, but uh, there you go. So aside from putting up some signs to warn people um, and putting some warning buoys, that's, that's pretty much all we've done. Um, you might remember um, plans for an airport in the, the Thames estuary, the so-called Boris Island, the idea of adding an extra one. Um, so you can see there's the marking of uh, the wreck of the SS Richard Montgomery and various tentatively planned sites uh, for this airport, which never came to fruition. Um, and you might think, well, okay, how bad can it possibly be if they were thinking of putting an airport there? Well, we can make some estimations based on what we know about the cargo. Um, so um, this is a chap with some uh, grenades that were found fairly recently. Back in 2018, um, an ice rink was constructed in Cambridge, in my hometown. Um, and while they were constructing it, they dug up uh, uh, the groundworks and they unearthed about 194 uh, of these grenades, so-called uh, AW bombs. Um, it looks like a milk bottle because that's literally what it is. They just filled milk bottles with yellow phosphorus, a little layer of water and rubber, and then some benzene on top, capped it off with a, a foil cap. They're self-igniting, um, and they're still very dangerous. Um, if you find anything like this in your garden, <laughs> walk, don't run, walk to the bomb squad calmly and ask them to help you. <laughs> um, here's a case that they found, which told them exactly what these were. Uh, they're known as AW bombs, and they were a sort of cheap and cheerful grenade, uh, again, from World War II era. Um, so these guys uh, caused uh, an evacuation of a couple of streets nearest to the construction site, just in case, while the bomb squad did their work. Um, and also there was an exclusion zone declared from Cambridge Airport, no flights in and out for a few hours while they were sorting out the bombs. So that's an idea of the precautions you take for that sort of thing. Um, this is a tall boy bomb. It's uh, known as an earthquake bomb. It's one of the largest bombs used during World War II. It's about five tons, 5.1 tons, known as a bunker buster. Uh, so it can go through about five meters of concrete with no trouble at all. Uh, it had to be dropped from specially reinforced Lancaster bomber planes. And they actually found one recently that hadn't gone off um, back in September 2019. Um, and my video isn't going to be able to play, so I will just bring it up separately. Bear with me. OK, here we go. Um, yes, yeah, so in a canal in Poland near the town of Svinovice, um, they found this unexploded tall boy bomb. It took a while to work out what they wanted to do with it. Um, but it ultimately accidentally went off in October 2020. You can see an aerial view here. Um, no one was hurt, thankfully. Um, it was done remotely. Um, but uh, yeah, as they were trying to defuse it, it, as you can see, threw a tremendous column of debris into the air. If anything had been in the canal at the time, uh, it would have been no joke. Um, so that's a single 5.1 ton bomb, um, thanks to the Poznan University of Technology for that footage. Okay, let's just get back into the slides. Uh, 
Okay. So, so um, the thing I want you to notice here is that this is a log scale. <laughs> so uh, the Cambridge grenades, each of them is about a pound of explosive. Um, the Svinovitsche bomb, sorry for the uh, Imperial units, but that's what they used back then, um, about 5,200. Um, the SS Richard Montgomery, from what we can work out, according to a report which drew together the original salvage records and, frankly, patchy records about what her cargo probably was, um, we think has about 3,105 tons of explosive material left in her. Um, it's not bad, considering the original cargo was about 5,900 tons, uh, but it's still a lot. About 14,500 individual bombs, uh, mostly loose in the forward holds, which were harder to get to. Some of them are now scattered on the seabed because the ship has started to break apart. Um, what could happen if they all went off? Well, the new scientist, uh, speculated in a, a report that it would send about a 3,000 meter high column of water and debris um, shooting into the air, and then subsequently a five meter high tsunami barreling up the Thames towards London. Uh, the town of Sheerness, about 40,000 people, would unfortunately be pretty much history. Um, the worrying thing is where she actually is positioned. Um, so obviously she's near to a town, uh, but she's also near to the Isle of Grain, uh, which has got a couple of interesting things on it. Um, so there's a liquid natural gas power plant. Um, there's also some extra spare liquid natural gas storage. It's actually the largest liquid natural gas storage terminal in Europe. Whoever decided to put it there, a little bit of a question about whether that was a wise idea was built back in the 90s. And there's also some petrochemical stores nearby as well. So it's quite possible that the explosion of the Montgomery might trigger additional explosions of uh, these uh, areas as well. And of course, this is the lovely town of Sheerness. That's the town clock there. The current strategy um, by the receiver of wreck, uh, the official owner of the, uh, the wreck of the Montgomery, part of the government, is watchful waiting. What that basically means is that uh, every year, since around the 90s, the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency does a detailed sonar survey of the wreck and just checks what's going on with it. Um, they assess whether the condition of the wreck has deteriorated noticeably um, since the last survey. Um, and they keep an eye on the munitions that have since tumbled out onto the seabed. Here's a picture. This is one of the latest sonar scan images that we have released from them. Um, one of the other worrying things about the Montgomery is her position. So this is a, a large uh, container ship going past the Montgomery. Um, there's actually quite a few of these coming past every day because her position is very close to a shipping approach, the Medway Approach Channel. Um, so that's filled with ships going towards um, the Sheerness Small Ship Anchorage. Sheerness Harbour, um, and all of the anchorages for the Isle of Grain. Um, so it's not just a matter of uh, leaving, the risks of leaving the Montgomery alone, undisturbed. There's um, a non-zero chance um, that she might be plowed into by a ship accidentally, or perhaps even deliberately. In the 60s, uh, some students uh, played a prank, uh, saying that they were going to run into the uh, SS Richard Montgomery that they had a ship that they were going to do it. Uh, it was just a joke. They had nothing like of that kind. Um, but it was worrying enough that there is, in fact, some security. Uh, so for instance, uh, during the London Olympics, um, the Coast Guard sent out a small boat to constantly patrol the uh, area around the Montgomery, just in case there was any chance of terrorist uh, incidents. But. Uh, the real risk here is accidental collision from something like a chemical tanker. And this has happened before. There's been near misses. Um, the worst one that we know of is this ship. This is a ship called the Mare Alton. It, on the 22nd of May, 1980, on a very foggy day, she came within, we think, about 10 meters of hitting the Montgomery's wreckage. 
Um, she was carrying about 1,500 tons of tooline at the time, which uh, is not a chemical that's known to react well to harsh shocks or sudden treatment. Um, thankfully, they did not collide. Um, also, local people do tend to just go out to the wreck. Um, there's not currently a sightseeing boat, um, but there certainly has been at the, in the past people going towards, even within the exclusion zone, um, touching the masks. Uh, this is a picture of a chap from 2017. Thought he would just paddleboard out there to check them out. There's really nothing to prevent people from doing this. It's just some boys and the idea that it's a bad idea to go there. Um, uh, so, in favour of the government's policy of just waiting to see what happens instead of actively trying to go in and remove bombs from the wreckage, there's the SS Kielse. So, she's another example of a ship filled with munitions that sank um, around the World War II era. So, she's smaller than the Montgomery. She sank uh, in 1946, about six kilometres away from Folkestone. She had a mixed cargo, so about, we think, about 1,780 tons in total of cargo, but perhaps only 100 tons of that was explosives. Um, so there was a salvage attempt on her. Um, back in the 60s, a firm won uh, the chance to salvage her, 1967, and uh, for reasons best known to themselves, they decided to use limpet mines to open up her hull to make it more easy to uh, salvage explosives. So the Kilsey did go off. Um, her explosion set off a 150-meter-high column of water and debris. Um, it was felt as a 4.5-magnitude earthquake, shattered windows in Folkestone. Thankfully, again, no one was actually hurt by the blast, uh, but they very well could have been. Uh, there's now a 47-meter-long, 6-meter-deep crater in the seabed off Folkestone, which is where she used to be. So you can kind of understand the reluctance to get in and dig around the Montgomery. Um, but uh, Dave Welch, a former Royal Navy bomb disposal expert, points out that we can't just continue leaving the wreck to fall apart. Somebody, at some point, over the next five to ten years, is going to have a very difficult decision to make. And I would say the sooner it's made, the easier and cheaper it will be as a solution. He uh, previously advised uh, the government on the, uh, the Montgomery's munitions. Uh, David Alexander, a professor of um, risk at UCL, uh, describes it as a rare case of ungovernable risk, that is, uh, risk that we cannot fully understand, a relatively rare example uh, for which there are no easy solutions. Um, but sooner or later they have to do something, he also agrees. The question is, will they do it too late? So at this point, you might be wondering, <laughs> What does all this have to do with software, anyway? I have taken you on a, a bit of a rambling journey. Um, I'm going to take you a bit further and talk to you about two historical uh, cases of software with flaws which subsequently caused um, terrible tragedies. So the first story I'm going to tell you is that of the Therac 25. Some people are nodding. Um, this case is fairly well known. So the Therac 25 was a medical accelerator, a so-called linear accelerator, was developed in the 70s and 80s for treating cancer. Um, it provided radiotherapy, um, so both electron radiotherapy for tumors that sat within shallow tissue, and also x-rays for targeting um, tumors that sat within deeper tissue. And the uh, this uh, kind of device had been uh, developed by the corporation AECL before, but the novelty about the Therac 25 was that it was computer controlled. So just to give you a picture of how the operative area of the Therac looked. So it had a turntable. Previously, um, electron radiation and x-ray radiation were given by separate medical devices. This was obviously an advance, being able to do it all on the same device. Um, it used a turntable, so one part was a mirror, which directed just a, a beam of light onto the patient, so you could see exactly where to target 
the radiation. The second piece was um, some electron scan magnets, so to direct the electron beam correctly. Um, and then finally, there was a, a tungsten target and flattener um, to attenuate uh, the beam and create the X-ray radiation. So um, I should note that um, a much greater electron beam current is required um, to deliver the appropriate dose of X-rays because the flattener is a really effective attenuator of radiation. So you need to put in about 100 times as much um, energy in order to get the right uh, medical dosage. This will become relevant soon. Um, so, as I said, this was developed by a company which had quite a bit of experience creating uh, these medical accelerators, but the Therac 25 was their first uh, fully automated one. It used a PDP-11 computer um, to do all of its uh, software control, and the operator saw a screen, sort of like this one, and they could, um, pretty advanced for the time, put in, type in parameters for the treatments that they were delivering to patients. So you could type in X for X-ray, E for electron mode, and then page up and page down to adjust um, all of the different other parameters, so the amount of dosage and so on. So uh, the Therac 25 is implicated in three deaths in total, um, overdoses of radiation. The, uh, Two cases I'm going to focus on here, um, because they happened in quick succession and were what made people realize what was going on, were at the East Texas Cancer Center in Tyler, Texas. This was uh, in March 1986. So uh, first thing was that uh, a man who'd had uh, a tumor removed from his back was in for his ninth treatment on the Therac 25. He was pretty accustomed to um, the treatments. Uh, this treatment was supposed to be a 22 mega electron volt electron beam treatment on the upper back, a little to the left of the spine. Um, so he was in the treatment room. The operator was behind uh, a screen. At the time, uh, audio had cut out between the room and the operator's room, so she didn't actually have a way to directly communicate with him. Um, the operator had held the job for some time, and her typing efficiency had increased with experience. She now quickly could enter prescription data and change it with the Therac's handy editing features. Um, she entered the patient's prescription data and then noticed that she typed X for X-ray instead of where she had intended E for the electron mode. So no problem, the Therac 25 allowed you to correct this. She pressed the page up button um, to hit the mode entry um, and edit it. Reached the bottom of the screen, the other parameters were fine, so she pressed the P key for proceed, and she saw this message. It's a message that said, malfunction 54, uh, treatment paused, dose input to. Um, the operators didn't have access to a key to the error messages, so she wasn't aware that dose input to meant that the dose that had been delivered was either too high or too low. Um, these were just numbers intended for debugging purposes. She was never supposed to have seen that error message. Um, but she often saw treatment pause messages. The machine was kind of buggy. Uh, often treatment would end up pausing and you'd have to restart it. Uh, it wasn't seen as a major problem. Um, so she did what she usually did, um, pressed the P key, because um, she saw that only six monitor units had apparently been delivered, um, whereas she'd requested 202 monitor units. So she took the normal action. Meanwhile, in the treatment room, um, the chap who was undergoing treatment um, immediately knew that something was very wrong. He'd had treatments with Therac 25 before, and this felt very different to treatment that he'd been given before. He said that he'd felt as if he'd received some kind of electric shock or someone had poured hot coffee down his back. So he actually started to get up um, and go towards uh, the operator's room to ask what was going on. When the second treatment kicked in, um, she pressed the key again. And uh, he said that at that point, he felt like he was being shocked by electricity. He went to the treatment room door and pounded on it. The operator was obviously very shocked and surprised to see him there. Um, he was examined by a physician who wor worried that maybe he'd been somehow shocked by electricity while using the device. He 
there was a reddening of the treatment area, but nothing else. They couldn't see anything more serious than that. Um, so he was discharged, sent home, um, told to tell them if there was anything further, any other reactions. The hospital physicist was called in and found that the machine was operating within parameters. They called in um, a team of electricians to check that uh, the machine was correctly grounded and there was no possibility that it could be delivering electric shocks to any of the patients and it was given a clean bill of health. What they didn't know that day is that um, the patient being treated had been delivered a fatal dose of radiation. He died five months later from complications of that overdose of radiation. After the Therac 25 was shut down for testing, um, they, they had the electricians come in and take a look at it. They also called out an engineer from AECL who reassured them that it wouldn't be possible to deliver an overdose um, using the Therac 25, that the computer controls would have prevented it. Um, so as far as they knew, everything was fine and the machine was put back into service the following day. Three weeks later, on the 11th of April, 1986, another patient was scheduled to have um, an electron treatment, for, this time for a skin cancer on the side of his face. Um, the prescription was for 10 mega electron volts. The same technician who treated the first victim uh, also prepared this patient for treatment. As with the previous patient, she entered the prescription data and then noticed an error. She'd automatically put in um, X-ray instead of electron. So she scrolled up and modified that parameter again. She saw the beam ready message displayed and clicked proceed. And then again, this error message, malfunction 54. Immediately, she then went to the room. She could, uh, they reconnected the audio link so she could hear the patient asking, what happened to me? What happened to me? Um, and they knew that something was very wrong at this point. The machine was taken out of service. This man had also undergone um, an overdose and died only three weeks after the accident because of the proximity to um, his head. So the machine was taken out of service. Um, ultimately, the FDA subjected the Therac 25 machines to a class one recall, meaning that they thought it was a high degree of likelihood that they would cause another fatal incident. Um, there were some other uh, accidents leading up to this, which in retrospect were known to be also overdoses. It was difficult at the time to distinguish these because the patients they were treating were already so sick and some of them did subsequently die of their disease. It's unclear whether in a couple of cases that was hastened by receiving an overdose of radiation that wasn't recognized at the time. Um, so what had happened, we now realize, and my many thanks to Nancy Levison's inquiry report for uh, the details that we now know, is that um, because of the turntable mechanism, um, there was a possibility to uh, overdose patients by presenting the uh, electron mode target, um, so just with the shaping magnets, but actually delivering an X-ray level of beam dose which would be about 100 times the dosage expected uh, for therapeutic purposes. This was only reproduced um, at the East Texas Cancer Center when um, the uh, diligent hospital physicist and the operator on duty worked together um, to reproduce that malfunction 54 message. They realized that it only happened at a certain speed of typing, um, that you had to um, type in the treatment parameters very quickly, scroll up quickly, just as a competent operator would do after years of experience. They'd already treated about 500 patients successfully with the Therac 25 before they developed these problems. They reported this to the manufacturer and there was some very productive meetings with the manufacturer, the FDA, the users. Um, they ultimately ended up modifying the Therac 25 to add mechanical interlocks so that this could not happen again. Um, in particular, they added a motion-enabled foot switch for the operator so that the turntable could only rotate under their deliberate control. Um, they also made sure that there was always um, an operative TV camera and intercom between the operator and the patient at all times. And they modified the way that the turntable microswitches were wired so that there was no possibility of getting um, an error from those.
So, a more recent case, the Boeing 737 MAX. So, these planes uh, obviously have been in the news. Um, the 737 MAX first came out as a huge success story. Uh, they began service in May 2017. Um, they were designed for fuel efficiency, competing directly with uh, the new Air Airbus A330neo uh, from 2014. So they had these huge uh, Rolls-Royce Trent engines, the latest uh, of their kind, which had almost a 15% increase in fuel efficiency, which is tremendous for airlines. So they were very attractive. Uh, a lot of airline orders went in. I think a record number of uh, the planes were purchased. And everything seemed fine until the 29th of October, 2018. Uh, when that morning, flight 610 from Lion Air, um, taking off from Jakarta in a domestic flight, crashed only 13 minutes after takeoff, crashed into the sea, and took the lives of 189 people, everyone aboard. I think you'll probably all remember this from the news, how dramatic that was and how uh, unprecedented. At the time, we'd seen very few airline tragedies for years. Um, Boeing was seen as an incredibly safe um, manufacturer, incredibly safe set of planes to fly on. There was even the phrase, if it's not Boeing, I ain't going. Um, the black boxes of Lion Air Flight 610 were recovered um, not long after the crash. They were recovered from the sea. Um, and accident investigators could see that there were repeated uh, nose down inputs uh, from the automatic flight controls to the plane. So what the pilots would have experienced in the few minutes before the crash would have been that they were trying to pull the plane's nose up, but for some reason something was repeatedly pushing the plane's nose down towards the ground. And what was revealed was that this was something called the MCAS, the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System. Um, this was an acronym that initially had appeared in the manual without any explanation. Um, it was just uh, left there as a sort of clue to what software was running aboard this plane. So the issue that Boeing had discovered during um, the construction of this plane was that because its airframe was the same as the 737 they'd used before, but it was a much heavier, uh, larger engine, um, the flight characteristics were different. The flight safe envelope was a bit narrower and they were concerned about stalling. Um, there was a notable case of an uh, Air France plane which had stalled through accidentally um, having the plane nose up too high, and obviously if you nose up as high as, uh, too high outside of the flight safe envelope, then the plane will just drop out of the sky. So in order to prevent this um, and to keep the plane um, flying safely, they invented something called the MCAS system, which would issue automatic nose down commands um, if it detected through uh, angle of attack sensors at the front of the plane um, that the plane was beginning to travel outside of the, the stable envelope. Um, so Boeing, after explaining uh, the existence of the MCAS system to pilots who previously had not heard of it, um, issued a revised checklist procedure for malfunctions, um, giving, giving to pilots instructions for what to do if they ran into a situation of this kind. Um, and they said that they were developing um, an improvement to the MCAS system uh, that would mean that even that checklist was unnecessary. So the world had a lot of trust in Boeing, um, and these planes continued to fly until the 10th of March, 2019, when Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302 uh, also crashed after takeoff, another Boeing 737 MAX. This time it crashed only six minutes after takeoff. It was flying from Addis Ababa to Nairobi, and it actually crashed near a town, uh, Bishoftu, populated by 195,000 people. Um, thankfully, no one on the ground was hurt, but everyone on the flight was killed instantly, 157 people. Um, so after this, on the 11th March 2019, China grounded the 737 MAX. The following day, the EU grounded them, Australia, Singapore, and the next day, the US grounded the planes as well. Um, 
This was basically as soon as the black boxes were recovered, showing a very similar uh, pattern of behavior, the fatal nose down, repeated nose down inputs. Uh, in the case of Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302, uh, what's even more tragic is that the pilots had responded correctly. They'd followed the procedure that Boeing had given them. They knew that the MCAS was being triggered, and they switched it off. But by the point they had done this, uh, the tail of the plane was jammed in a nose-down position. They were unable to recover it, and uh, they accelerated into the ground. It was so bad that uh, pilots were reportedly uh, worried about flying empty 737 Maxes just to take them um, to safe places for storage while the plane was grounded. You might remember the news, planes coming down in different places, uh, flights being cancelled. This is a picture of a whole field of 737 Maxes grounded while the investigation went on. Um, the culprit behind this was one of the culprits behind this uh, series of tragedies was the fact that the MCAS system was dependent on what turned out was a single angle of attack sensor at the nose of the plane. Uh, you know that in aeronautics, this is never done. You never rely on a single sensor input for anything. You don't trust your sensors. You always check them against each other. Um, NASA's flight control notoriously had five computers and five sets of various sensors so that they could have a consensus on what data to accept. Um, so it seems likely that anything from uh, a Mylar balloon to a bird strike to poor maintenance of this particular sensor led to each of these tragedies. And so uh, after a long series of investigations and improvements, uh, the Boeing 737 MAX planes are now back in the air. This time, the MCAS system depends on multiple angle of attack sensors. Um, repeated activations have been disabled, and various other problems with the system have been corrected after working with the FAA. Um, and so far, uh, all seems to be fine. Um, so some shared flaws from these two case studies then. So people can often have, if you're building a system that combines software and hardware, a sort of false sense of overconfidence in the software. You might have chatted with mechanical engineers before who've said, oh, don't worry, we'll fix this in software. Those words should fill you with dread. We have this idea that software is somehow um, magical, that it's more robust than the mechanical systems we build, whereas nothing could be further from the truth. Software is just as unreliable as any other kind of system that we build. Um, we also uh, know that in both cases, the companies were complacent. They were building on past successes, um, putting together uh, systems that were leading the world in the things that they were trying to do. Um, and having delivered many successful iterations of what felt like similar products, the Therac uh, 25 device was created after a very successful uh, series of uh, previous Therac devices, the Therac 20, the Therac 6. The difference was that the Therac 25 uh, was developed with software controls only. The Therac 20, which was also known to have some misbehavior when it was handled by people like uh, university students who were first learning um, to uh, work with the system. Uh, these misbehaviors didn't lead to any major problems because it had mechanical interlocks, which prevented any actual overdosing from taking place. Um, I'd like to present you with some rules of thumb, then, to take you through things that you personally can do um, to try and spot flaws in systems that you are working with um, to make sure that you uncover serious errors before they have a chance to actually cause harm to users, whether that's uh, serious harm in the case of safety critical systems or harm to your reputation as a company, harm to their experience, um, harm to your ability to help them. So uh, my rules of thumb then. Uh, Take your bug reports seriously. Assess the state of the wreck. Listen to the voice of inexperience. And 
listen to the jokes. So first of all, take your bug reports seriously. So I really like this book, um, Debugging. It's a book by David J. Agans. Uh, I like it so much that I have his poster on my wall at home. Uh, and it lays out the debugging rules um, that you should follow if you're trying to trace down um, a nasty bug. The main rule I want to focus on, so there's, uh, I believe, nine rules. Understand the system, make it fail, quit thinking and look, divide and conquer, change one thing at a time, keep an audit trail, check the plug, get a fresh view, and if you didn't fix it, it ain't fixed. So understanding the system and making it fail is something that um, the technicians failed to do for Tarak 25. They couldn't reproduce the malfunction 54 error, so they assumed that it just wasn't important. Um, what they didn't know was that uh, the error was caused by rapid typing, by the specific conditions um, that the East, East Texas uh, Cancer Center um, had an operator who was experienced and who could type at those speeds. Um, but there's no excuse for not being able to reproduce an error. If you can't reproduce it, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It just means you might not have tried hard enough to copy the conditions under which it happened. Um, the final one, um, the most important one in this case, I think, is if you didn't fix it, it ain't fixed. Good intentions are not enough. Checking the obvious things is not sufficient. If you haven't actually made any changes, or if you've planned to make changes, but you haven't actually implemented those changes, then your system is just as flawed as it was before. Um, we're often guilty of this wishful thinking of, you know, well, perhaps my latest push has fixed this unrelated bug as well, because it's in the same part of the code base. But the truth is, we can't afford to think that way. Um, if we can't justify something, then we can't close that bug report. The second rule of thumb I'd like you to think about is assessing the state of the wreck. So just as with the Richard Montgomery, um, the least we can do is survey the damage regularly. Uh, if we're looking at a code base, there are some tools now that we can use um, that they didn't have access to back in the 80s that hopefully will enable us to figure out at least a plan of action for what areas are likely to be um, the most susceptible to failures. We can look through our documentation. We can take a look at some profiling tools, commit history. We can ultimately do a behavioral code analysis, and we can also add some tests. So documentation is an interesting one, because often if you have uh, a big, hairy old legacy system, there isn't much documentation to go on. Sometimes you feel lucky if there's any at all. Um, but even a sparse amount of documentation can be valuable. Uh, if you see some cryptic warning signs, something like a lonely boy just drifting in the middle of the sea, saying danger prohibited area, or to do, fix this. <laughs> Just allow a little red flag to pop up in your mind about that section of the code. And if you are struggling with a lack of documentation, um, I highly recommend Heather Stenson's talk, Any Friend of the Docs is a Friend of Mine. Uh, that's from Write the Docs at Portland, I believe. Uh, in which she describes the steps that you can take to encourage every member of the team, not just people who are specifically focused on documentation, um, to become invested in good docs uh, for your system. I would also recommend uh, this book by Adam Tornhill, so we're getting into forensic code analysis now, looking at commit histories um, to try and figure out where the bugs may be lurking to understand your system as a whole. It's a book called Your Code as a Crime Scene. Um, he also has an excellent uh, subsequent uh, book about software design x-rays, uh, which I would recommend too. Um, so this describes using um, a free analysis tool called CodeMap that he developed, which allows you to draw maps of code uh, against commits. So if you have a modern version control system, 
especially Git, but even it deals with Subversion, um, other tools like that, then you can draw some really interesting uh, graphs of commits to different areas of the code. So you can start to immediately see things like, this file only has one major contributor who left the company in 2019. Maybe we should have a look at that. Or this file has lots of small commits from lots of different people. Um, so there's uh, a great paper, um, Don't Touch My Code, uh, examining the effects of ownership on software quality, uh, which reveals that, so there's, they uh, analyzed the code bases of Windows 7 and Windows Vista. Uh, these guys uh, worked for Microsoft. And they kind of divided um, the binaries that they looked at into two types. So the first type is uh, a.dll, where the top contributor makes something like 50% of the total commits and is clearly the owner of that piece of code. Um, there's also some major contributors, about four of them, and four minor contributors who are making fewer contributions to the code. Contrast that with something like b.dll, where the top contributor has only made about 20% of the commits. There's four major contributors, but they're not that major, and there's a whole load of really long tail of minor contributors, 74 in total in this case, folks who've often made just a single commit. Um, and to perhaps no one's surprise, um, binaries like this have way more failures. So they uh, looked at pre-release failures and post-release uh, issues, and things like b.dll had about eight times as many pre-release failures, and nearly twice as many post-release failures. The number of minor contributors has a strong positive relationship with both of these failures. So um, if you have relatively few minor contributors and strong ownership of code, your code is likely to be more robust, um, which is an interesting finding. It does reinforce something that you might already sort of have an instinct for. Um, and it also tells us uh, some useful things that we can do with that information. So uh, their suggestion and their conclusions of their report is that uh, minor contributions should be always reviewed by the major contributors to those files. Um, or even better, uh, minor contributors should talk with the major contributor of the file that they want to make the changes to, and they should work together to make those changes so that the changes are made in a robust way by someone who's most familiar with how that code is laid out. Um, and for the places where you can't manage to do that, uh, low ownership components, we should focus our testing efforts on those um, because we know that that's where um, we're likely to find lurking problems. Also, the more you touch code, the more it goes wrong. It turns out that churn is a great measure of whether we're likely to find bugs uh, in a piece of our software, literally just measuring lines added, lines modified, and lines deleted. Lines deleted is a slightly worse measure, but lines added and lines modified are very good, especially combined, um, at telling us where there may be problems. Which, if you think about it, makes sense. If something is starting to go wrong, you might often make small changes to the area because you know something's up and you're trying to fix it repeatedly. Um, so again, that's pointing an arrow, a red flag, at a particular part of your code base um, and making you take a closer look. Um, this is from a paper, Does Measuring Code Change Improve Fault Prediction? Um, where they found that the number of times a file has been changed in the last two releases really uh, strongly predicts the behavior in this release, whether there'll be a bug that's traced back to code in that file. Alternatively, we should all just go home early because the more we touch our code, the worse it looks. So to uh, bring things back um, to tests, so um, again, if you're working with a large piece of legacy code, you might not have many tests. You might not have any tests. Or you might have been working on developing something at such a fast and furious pace that you didn't have time to add tests, or you felt like you didn't have time to add tests. Um, the comic, for those who can't read, says, uh, as someone who's uh, reviewing a code, we received your delivery on time, but we couldn't find the tests. Tests? What tests? You know, the unit tests. The ones for testing the application layer, quality assurance and all. Ah, yes, the unit tests. There aren't any unit tests. 
No tests? But what about the guidelines? How do you check that everything works correctly? Um, it's magic. Uh, you may find yourself uh, falling prey to this kind of thinking. Um, I know that it can be really hard to add appropriate unit tests. Sometimes it feels like you're just testing something for the sake of it, that you're not creating actually a robust test. You're just making something else that's going to break easily when you want to change the code later. Um, the one thing I would suggest adding, if you don't already have, is a smoke test, some kind of overall basic test of the system's functionality, the kind of thing that a skilled QA tester would do regularly every time you made an update. Um, see if there's some way to automate that, even some part of that, um, and run that against changes that you make. And that can be really helpful for pinpointing bugs before things set themselves on fire, uh, rather than after you've already released something to users. Uh, OK, so on to my next rule of thumb, listening to the voice of inexperience. Um, so it's really easy to get habituated to a dangerous situation, uh, almost an untenable situation. Um, we can find it uh, quite hard to distance ourselves from the code that we're working on um, and get falsely confident about how good it is so it's a really good idea to listen to newcomers, people like interns, new starters, people from a different part of the company who are approaching our code base for the first time, maybe code they haven't worked on before within the same code base. Um, sometimes the only way to snap out of your ingrained habit of dismissing a problem is to listen to someone else new start to worry about it. Um, I would argue that part of the onboarding process for new programmers uh, should be to ask them what flaws they can see in our code, if there's any unexploded bombs that they are starting to notice. There's usually an, and do you have any questions for us, uh, stage of interviews, for instance, or in check-ins during an internship. But we very rarely uh, take the feedback that we receive in these sorts of situations seriously, um, or get into enough detail to understand what might be wrong with the code base uh, that we're dealing with, what might be confusing or painful for them to work with. Um, so to get past this issue, I highly recommend doing uh, something called a code walk. So uh, there's a talk by a previous speaker at PyCon UK, Mary Chester Cadwell, called Code Walk This Way, um, that you should definitely check out. Um, it's really shaped the way that I teach and learn about new code bases. Um, and it gives you a structured process to follow when pairing with someone new to talk them through the code and also get information back from them about what they're seeing um, that maybe you can't see because you're too familiar with it. It helps you to reflect on the health of different parts of your code base. Is there anything where you explain it out loud and it sounds really weird or seems a bit counterintuitive, convoluted, awkward? Is there any space where you wish that you had docs for a certain feature that just don't currently exist? These places may be where problems are lurking. And finally, you should listen to the jokes. So this mural uh, <laughs> is the Sheerness Mermaid mural, the Montgomery Mermaid. It was made by a chap called Dean Tweedy for the Promenade Arts Festival. Um, and if you can't read at the back, it says, welcome to Sheerness, you'll have a blast. And there's a picture of a mermaid looking a bit grumpy holding the detonator on a stack of TNT leading out to the SS Richard Montgomery, uh, which is just peacefully sitting in the sea off Sheerness. Um, Matt Brown, the chairman of Sheerness Enhancement Association for Leisure, has condemned this mural, saying, if I was a family visiting, whether I knew about the Montgomery or not, I wouldn't want to be sitting at the leisure park with the kids, being reminded you have those explosives out there. The artist rebutted, I wanted to make people aware of the Montgomery as it's part of Sheerness. Some people would like to deny its existence. The mermaid makes some local people uncomfortable because she reveals a truth about their town that they'd rather not have to acknowledge, the ever-present danger to their lives from offshore explosives. For a certain kind of authority figure, the reminder of a dangerous situation is worse than the actual danger because without that reminder, they can continue to live their lives in comfort without having to address the elephant in the room. Sometimes the equivalent of a Sheerness Mermaid mural 
can be the only way to spot a problem that's become ingrained in the way that your code is put together. Is there a particular XKCD or Dilbert cartoon that seems to epitomize the bugs and problems that you've been experiencing? Perhaps all the developers working on a particular part of the code base have a set of in-jokes describing the way a certain class behaves itself. A kind of gallows humor about how annoying something is to use. Um, maybe it makes you cringe because it's just a little too accurate. These are clues to what might be some underlying dysfunctions in your code. And I want to add a secret further rule of thumb, which is to take pride in care and skill, not speed. We often come to think, and our field encourages us to think this way, that faster is better. It is only better in certain circumstances, and sometimes it's not better at all. These are some posters from the Liberty Ships uh, construction program back in 1943, down the ways in fewer days, the slogan of the month from the Labor Production Committee. And Ships for Victory, which has a nice quote from Franklin D. Roosevelt, speed, more speed. Um, the Liberty ships were notoriously constructed on tight timelines. Hundreds of them were sent across the Atlantic with vital supplies, um, but some corners were cut during their construction. Um, the record for the construction of a Liberty ship was the SS Robert E. Peary, which was put together in four days, 15 hours and 29 minutes. That's one heck of a sprint. Um, but Liberty ships sometimes just fell apart. They were constructed with steel uh, that was not of uh, usual construction grades. Uh, notoriously, some of them cracked uh, when they were traveling across uh, cold parts of the Atlantic because the steel wasn't designed to be subjected to freezing temperatures. Um, and then there are ships like uh, the Montgomery who were constructed to be strong enough for their time, strong enough for the job they were built to do, but certainly not strong enough for the job that they're doing now, which is containing a bunch of unexploded munitions for many subsequent decades. Uh, so this might be familiar too, the slogan of Facebook, move fast and break things. I um, don't know if you can see the uh, post-its at the bottom, except for data and push and heart. Oh, break dancing is okay, apparently. <laughs> so even at the time, people are a bit dubious about this slogan, as you can see. Um, they've now disavowed the slogan. Uh, apparently, Facebook's official uh, motto now is to move fast with stable infrastructure. <laughs> which doesn't quite trip off the tongue in the same way. Um, but in all seriousness, I think we should all aim towards a more sustainable pace of work. If you work quickly, you fail to spot important things, and you construct things that are shoddier than you would have done otherwise. I think the movement towards software craftsmanship is really important. And if we value ourselves and our labor, then taking a little bit more time to make it right the first time is well worth it, especially when you consider that maintenance is the largest part of the software life cycle. If you don't make it right, you'll just end up trying to fix it repeatedly in the future. So I'm just about coming to the end of my talk now. Um, I'd like to give many thanks to uh, my original sources, uh, especially David Alexander's 2019 work, The Strange Case of the Richard Montgomery. Um, this was uh, very handy for getting uh, all of my facts about munitions ships right. Also uh, indebted to Nancy Levison and Clark Turner's investigation into the Therac 25 incidents um, and their subsequent follow-ups to those. Um, also, the excellent documentary, Downfall, The Case Against Boeing, uh, which I believe is currently available on Netflix, no endorsement. Uh, I'd also like to thank my wonderful colleagues at Anvil for putting up with my obsession with this ship for the last <laughs> several years um, and allowing me to rant about legacy code to them repeatedly. Um, I'm moving to York, so this is going to be my last hurrah for Anvil. Um, I will miss you guys so much. You have been wonderful colleagues. We'll miss you too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and finally, I would like to thank the SS Richard Montgomery herself for not blowing up before I gave this talk. <laughs> Given the momentous events of the last several weeks, I was honestly a little in doubt. Uh, I, I am very glad to say that she's still there, just off sheer ness, waiting, resting. So far, undisturbed. Uh, thank you very much.